Skibbity Toilet, they're Geekscapists. Welcome to a brand new Geekscape episode. I'm Jonathan London, your host. If this is your first Geekscape, well, strap yourselves in for some pop culture talk. I've got a great episode today. We're going to be talking some news, some reviews with my good friend, Fernando Pinto, who has a brand new, brand new comic up on Kickstarter called Gun Punch. But listen, here's the important thing you Geekscapists need to know about Fernando. Fernando's been a part of Geekscape since before Geekscape. Because he did the logo for Geekscape, and before that, he did the logo for Geek Drome, the predecessor podcast to Geekscape. And now Fernando is here on Geekscape to talk about his brand new comic, Gun Punch. I think it's a. Well, I'll talk to him. I'll have him tell you, but I think it's a collected a collection of the Gun Punch stuff on Kickstarter now, and it's already funded. So, like, don't stress. No, actually, <laughs> I like to see my friends succeed. And if you can hit some of those stretch goals, I think there's some cool stuff in there for you. Uh, that being said, <laughs> Geekscape is driving me crazy because people are like, can I come on Geekscape? Can I come on Geekscape? It's just booked solid. And I love that. I love that people want to come on Geekscape and talk to me. Uh, and I love talking to people. I'm an addict. Uh, but if you want to hear those conversations like last week's episode how awesome was chris black talking about monarch legacy of monsters the godzilla show on apple i loved hearing about him show running that show um there's a lot of geeks games booked for the for the next couple months uh next week we got uh i hope i don't mispronounce their name uh lila sturges uh lila is a writer on things like jack of fables it's one of the fables books uh, with bill winningham i know lumber janes is one of the uh books that They've also written on um, a lot of you guys like those indie comics like Lumberjanes, but also they've written like JSA for, for DC and all sorts of cool stuff like as a Tana book. Uh, and then the week after that, I've got, we're going to talk filmmaking. Uh, I got my buddy Dan Brown who wrote and directed a movie that's like number six. Maybe it's five. But maybe you can get it to number one on Netflix US. It's called Your Lucky Day. And it's an indie film. And the reason you might be like, I think I've heard of that. Yeah. And Angus Cloud, the late Angus Cloud uh, is in the movie. Um, he's in, he was in Euphoria. Like he became a, a kind of a star before passing away uh, from Euphoria. And Dan put him in this movie, Your Lucky Day. And I think it was completed after Angus passed away, sadly. I hope he was able to see some form of the movie before he passed away. But Dan's going to be on the podcast in two weeks to talk about that movie. If you want to prep for that, it's on Netflix right now uh, on the most popular uh, Netflix uh, programs in the U.S. Um, all right, we got tons to talk about. <laughs> it's just, it's coming at me fast. Uh, I'm going to go to the list of things to talk about. Okay, I saw that Dune movie, part two. I'll tell you guys my thoughts on Dune, part two. I'll, I'll keep it spoiler-free. Um, X-Men 97 is about to premiere. I've been catching up on the old X-Men animated cartoon episodes. And already, right before it premiered, Marvel Disney replaced the showrunner on that one. Uh, we're going to be talking some comics and also an old Geekscapist who was a guest on Geekscape wrote a letter to Marvel saying you need to release the 1994 uh, Fantastic Four movie. The very, very, very maligned Fantastic Four movie that is like a cult classic now from 1994, the Roger Corman one. Uh, and he wrote this letter, and it's gone kind of viral, saying, hey, Marvel, the reason y'all can't make a good Fantastic Four movie is because you're cursed, because you never officially released the Fantastic Four movie from 1994. And if you fix it, the curse may be lifted. And that's our good friend Joseph Culp, who played Doctor Doom. And it's like, Doctor Doom is like cursing Marvel. Curse is like the same way in the comics. He's like, curses Richards. Uh, Joseph Culp has written this letter to say, curse is Marvel, and say, like, Marvel, you better release that Roger Corman Fantastic Four and make it canon in the multiverse, or the curse will continue and you'll keep making bad Fantastic Four movies. Uh, it's kind of fun. Like, I mean, is it true? Do you think the Fantastic Four franchise is cursed? Uh, Joseph wrote this letter. He sent me an email, and uh, I'm going to read a little bit of that letter on the air. And hopefully we get Joseph in here. I don't know when. I don't know when somebody can come on Geekscape anymore because we're booked. But it's a good problem to have because I love talking movies, video games, comic books, TV, pop culture. And I'm so pumped to talk to my dear friend, Fernando Pinto, who I've collaborated with many times over the last, Fernando, brace yourself, 
18 years, but we've never met in person. But we're going to talk right now on Geekscape, so strap yourselves in. Let's do some Geekscaping. You're in the right spot. Here we go. Radical, awesome, whatever. <laughs> Welcome to Geekscape. Um, let's get to it. My good friend Fernando Pinto is the writer and artist behind this brand new comic, Gun Punch. Do I call it a comic? Do I call it a graphic novel? Uh, I really don't know what format it was released in. I'm sorry, Fernando, I'm a really bad friend. Uh, but let's have you in here to explain it. He is a amazing, fun, poppy comic book creator, and he's on Geekscape right now. Fernando, I love you, man. Hey man, love you too, dude. And why do you keep going? We're old. We're We're straight up old. old. Uh, (laughs) We're old, but we're gold. Uh, Why do you keep going to New York Comic Con instead of San Diego Comic Con, where Geekscape would gladly host you for the week and let Uh you sign at the booth and give you exposure at our booth? And instead, you go and you foot the bill for a artist alley booth at New York Comic Con, which is the best artist alley in any convention in the world. And um. And we'd never meet because you go to New York Comic Con instead of San Diego, where we are a mainstay since 2010. I wasn't prepared for the third degree on that. But uh, I don't know, dude. I I, I, I hang out what? Sorry, with yes, friends from uh, from New York. And I usually have a place to stay there. So I started going as a – and I've never been to San Diego. I'm a little scared of it. Why? You know, I've, I've heard it's so huge. I don't know. I just need to – So you go to New York City? Dude, like it's the... smaller. It's smaller than San Diego Comic Con. That's what I've heard. Oh, you're about. talking about the convention, not the actual convention, city. Yeah, of course. No, 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 no. I've it, listen. I've been to both, and I think you're right in going to New York Comic Con because their Artist Alley is superior. It is the best Artist Alley of any convention ever. And right. Geekscapist, if you're listening to this and you're like, "What convention do I go to get the autographs and meet the artists and really spend some time with comic book artists?" in a pure sense, right? Like no celebrities, no distractions from the big studios. It is the artist alley at New York Comic Con. It's in a separate freaking room down a hallway, like downstairs. It's it's a clubhouse. It's so much fun. That being said, the behemoth, the cultural, the pop culture mecca, the nerd spring break that is San Diego Comic Con, first, I think you should experience. Second, if you're worried about putting your toe in the water and out of fear of falling into the deep end, you have friends as well. You have Mr. Matt Kelly, who will throw you a life preserver. You've got me. I will be your guide. And you can always be a guest at San Diego Comic Con with us. That being said, don't do it this year. (laughs) Because (laughs) I think my baby is going to be born that week or the week later. Thank you. Uh, Geekscapus, Matt Kelly and I are talking almost daily about the plan for San Diego Comic Con. There will be a Geekscape presence. There will be a Geekscape booth. I will tell you right now that they've moved to the Geekscape booth after the fiasco you may have heard about from last summer. If you listen to Geekscape, you know we had some problems with the convention and our neighbors. You're not, you're not selling me on this, man. Well, Jonathan, <laughs> thought it was, Jonathan thought it was a good idea and he got encouragement from Heidi and Matt to go yeah. down to San Diego Comic Con with a microphone okay. and start barking from the geekscape booth into a microphone and why not all the other booths are much louder than us and they show trailers and they go crazy and they show play Hans zimmer music so who's even going to worry about jonathan with a microphone at the geekscape booth well our neighbors hated it in san diego comic-con threatened us to like basically said hey we're going to turn this all off if you keep yelling into the microphone and i mean was i saying nice things Maybe not. A, <laughs> was it the yeah. volume or the content? What was the problem there? I was told it was the volume. Okay. We lowered the volume and then I was told it was the content. <laughs> but listen, 
<laughs> the strategy was bad. Right. If you come and tell me it's the content, I'll fix the content. If you come and tell and you lie to me, if you lie to me and you tell me it's the volume when it's the content, then I'm then I'm just mad. And then the content gets worse. And I it, listen, I who's at fault? <laughs> let's let's, let's talk let, who's who's really at fault? It's me. It's me. <laughs> I thought I was like a nerd Howard Stern there. Just yeah. I thought I was the people's champion because I was promoting all the indie creators in our booth or in our aisle, row in our aisle against these giant corporations that have seemed to proliferate around us. And so I told them, I said, move us to the indie publishers area where I can champion all the independent creators in the area, not artist alley, just like where there's independent publishers and creators like fan base press are friends Mega 64, Troma. This is really our neighborhood. Where, that's where we belong. And so I'm happy to report right here on Geekscape that next summer, uh, this coming summer, we're going to be near the indie publishers. And I will be able to promote all of them and yell as loud as I can because we're far away from the studios who are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to play their trailer for that Netflix thing you're not even going to watch. You know what I mean? Like, it's just another I, square I, on your screen. Nerd, I felt like I was the nerd Robin Hood. For an <laughs> You're just like the voice of the people. I thought I was. but so, so this summer, we're going down and Matt is, by design, Matt, we're going to have like a throwaway, but like a booth that maybe is a little punk rock. And if I'm there for one day, two days, whatever, the, the booth is designed for Matt to be able to throw it in a dumpster on, on Sunday and get out because I, I'm, I know I won't be there Sunday. Like my, my baby's scheduled to be early August and the con is from the 25th to the 28th night, somewhere in there. So I'm not messing with that man. I'm not messing I mean, with it. Yeah. That's probably the responsible thing to do. Why don't you come down and just do like the, just do my job. Just come down and like yell at well, people. I can't this year because I got uh, I got a scheduled trip on those dates. But let's okay. talk next year. For real, Fernando. Like it's yeah. insane that we've been collaborating for eighteen years and we've never even hugged each other, homie. Yeah, man. We, we love just comics. Hold each other tight. <laughs> we love comics. We love punk rock. Yeah, man. We love everything. Like all the good stuff, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell me real quick about this Gun Punch comic that you have on Kickstarter, because. You know, I almost canceled you because, you know, you told me to, you really wanted to come on Geeks here to talk Gun Punch. And then you go and yeah. you fund on Kickstarter in a day. So why do you yeah, even need to be here? Because I wanted to hang out with you, man. I need an excuse. <laughs> you never yeah. return my calls. Yes. Um, come on now. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, basically, Gun Punch was a, a webcomic that I started right before the pandemic. And I worked on it uh, through the pandemic to, uh, and published like half of the story. Uh, on my website in black and white. And now we're publishing the whole story in a graphic novel. It's going to be published by Rocket Ship Entertainment, the same guys that uh, put out uh, Outrage by Fabian Nizieza, uh, the guys that put out Let's Play. They do all the legendary uh, comics, like the Dune adaptation that's coming out in comic book form. They're printing it out. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, this yeah, comic, cool I just stuff. this Lila Sturgis comic that I just promoted that they're going to be on the show next week, that's a legendary comics it's probably okay, going to go so through rocket ship then. That's really cool. Okay, yeah, so man. rocket ship. Okay, I'm doing all the research. Like you know that I'm working on an indie comic. Like you've seen some yeah. of the artwork, and so I'm doing all the research for like, oh, who should distribute it? Who should publish it? Who should go out and do it? You know, like like I'm I'm, I'm just putting all the things together for this indie comic. And Geek Savers, you're going to hear a lot about it as we get closer to summer. You'll be seeing artwork and things like that. But I've been in research phase for months and. And Fernando, that sounds really exciting, man. Like, yeah. Uh, so I was going to make a joke that the Geekscapists can just go read the comic for free on the web because it's a web comic. But you say that the only half the story got published. Exactly. That's a nice hook. Yeah. That's a nice hook. Okay. Yeah, you can read about half of it in, in my website at FernandoPinto.com. But it's, okay. all, it's also in black and white. And now we're doing the whole thing in color. And it's coming out in a nice, nice book by the people at rocket ship. So, and it's a cool, like if you if like sci-fi, if you like action, it's about, it's a story about a guy named Evan who after the worst day in his life, he loses his job, he loses his girlfriend. He goes to a bar and hooks up with a mysterious girl. And then the next day he wakes up with superpowers and being okay. chosen to save earth. The thing is he sucks at it. So he gets beat <laughs> up a lot. And also his, um, his salary 
as the savior of Earth is prorated from the amount of aliens that he kills a week. And he's not very good at it. So he's a bit so of a bounty hunter too. Or some, or assassin or something. Yes. He, ha he has to protect the Earth from this upcoming alien invasion. Or that's what he thinks anyway. There's oh, some mysteries down the road. Intrigue. But like, I like your style. I've always liked your style. Clearly, I love the... the there's two pieces of your artwork. on the. If you're watching this on YouTube, Twitch, or, or, Facebook, or Facebook, there's a bit of your artwork twice on the screen. The Geekscape logo there in the corner is your artwork. Yes, Johnny Zapp. And then your gun punch artwork here which like it reminds me of stuff like geeks if you're listening like scud the disposable assassin and like stuff like I, that i it's get that a like, lot yeah. yeah it's just like a really cool angular punk rock feel to your art that has just a ton of energy and i've always been such a fan man oh thank you man thank you yeah i i'm i'm more of the school of like comic books should be almost trying to be in motion you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of really cool art that's very static and you see that a lot in comic books today. And I'm, I, I like cartoons. I like anime. I like action movement. So I try to put that into my work as much as I can. You love the anime. You love I, all of it. I love manga more than anime. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It's a it, pacing it, thing because manga, but, you control the pacing and anime sure. tends to be slower at times. At times. Uh -huh. So you, so that kind of like takes me out of it. But in manga, you, you control the pacing and you get like that, that sensation of movement out of a static page. That sure. to me, that's like the best. And so Akira Toriyama, who created Dragon Ooh. Ball Z, yeah. he, he died this week, right? Yeah. Like he was 68 years old. That's young. I know we joke about yeah. us being old, but like Akira Toriyama, like so many people are upset about his death as they should be he is a legend in the manga world right yeah. how can you talk about that because i'm not i found dragon ball z late and it like i think wow. that i think here in the states stuff like tonami and like mm -hmm. like all that uh cartoon network stuff really really exploded anime and manga here in the states because they dragon ball z got played uh almost exclusively it was dragon ball z for a while um, what was your exposure to Dragon Ball Z? And is that is that one of your favorites? I think it's I mean, everybody. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, Akira Toriyama is one of my favorite mangaka. And he's like the first one that I knew by name. You know, mm -hmm. I, I first read my first uh, Dragon Ball ma manga I read when I was living in Spain when I was 13. So it, it got me like right at that age. And it, I think he's one of my biggest influences, to be honest. Like that guy... I think there's Osamu Tezuka, the guy that did uh, Astro Boy. Yeah, who's the, then, the Japanese Walt Disney? That yeah, he's Walt say. Disney, right? Right. He, he creates what we understand as manga and anime. But then you have Akira Toriyama, which to me, he's like the second in that Monk Rushmore of mangaka. Because that dude brought it like worldwide. Like he had a, uh, his sensibilities melded really well with Japanese people, but also with the rest of the world. You know, and especially like if you're ever in South America, dude, like Dragon Ball is huge down. I've been to South America several times and it's huge. It's it is absolutely huge. big. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with the, the, the Spanish language dubs as well. That like oh, when I was a kid, like a lot of that stuff. <laughs> and remember all on Geek Drum, the joke about like like anime being robot titties? <laughs> because what, what's the name of that that cartoon? It's like something z it's like M massinger z. massinger z what? like i think yeah. there's the female like robot yeah that shoots she out of her chest shoots yeah. missiles from her yeah, chest then yeah. they're the breasts and i would watch that in mexico dubbed not that mexico right. is south america it's still north right. america but but the spanish language dubs of anime proliferated in mexico and south america regularly and on the u.s like all we had for so long was like oh, here you get to watch um uh, akira and ninja scroll <laughs> like that's all and, we and get. that's not the most accessible stuff to watch it's, especially it's, well akira. it's well i'm a kid right like yeah, as yeah. a kid we're not watching that we'd rather watch the girl with the missile <laughs> chest <laughs> so i do get that south america and um in mexico and places like that had those spanish language dubs and those were on tv and then of course the newsstands still carry comics. They still carry comics today, and that's a really healthy culture. I mean, yeah, discovering yeah. that stuff. Uh, for whatever newsstand distribution we still have, you you can still find comics there. But if for years, it was everywhere. 
everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think uh, Toriyama's work had humor, had action, had heart. You know, uh, the characters were likable. His designs were amazing. The way he dressed his characters is really like cool looking, you know? So I don't know, man, it's, it's a great loss. And I mean, it happens to a lot of mangaka that they die young because the work schedule is so rigorous. Is that right? Yeah, dude, the Berserker guy died last year. And it was the same thing. He was like 54, 55. Jesus. And they Did worked you... themselves to death. Did you see that Justin Chatwin came out and apologized for the 2007, <laughs> eight or yeah. nine Dragon Ball yeah. movie? Like, it's like, dude, that ain't on you, man. Like, no, there's a lot of people <laughs> there. That, <laughs> yeah, that was not a good. Yeah, movie. he played Goku in the the live action American movie. Um, speaking of live action, you know, I know it's not strict manga. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's. I mean, some people consider it anime, but uh, I hinted at, it at in the intro to the last episode, but. Heidi and I went, through, got through all eight episodes of the live action Avatar: Last Airbender that Netflix did. Have mm -hmm. you been watching? Did you watch that? No, I I just got into the cartoon like a month <laughs> ago. I'm watching you, it now. Oh my god, you're where yeah. Heidi is on the cartoon then? Because Dude, I'm in, I'm finishing the second season. Right so now. I turned on this live action yeah. and I was like, okay, I had heard criticism of it in the days leading up to my, my ability to see it. So it had been out a few days before I could see the, the live action avatar. And I'd heard the criticisms. And as I start watching this first episode, I think you'll agree with me that the animated version is so much fun. And even though it has some really serious themes and is really well written and, and has some heavy storytelling in it, the majority of it is fun and light and still yeah. predominantly a kid's show. And the characters are fun. They're silly at times, even though that there's a lot of like earth saving, you know, going on and, and there's high stakes. It's still very much a silly, fun show at times. Almost immediately on this Netflix version, you're going to be missing that stuff. It is incredibly dark and serious. And you even see the Fire Nation people like lighting people up on screen, like straight up blasting them into flames. And you have to be ready for that because um, it, it's almost like they took it in a very super serious way, uh, even though the origins of it are a kid's show. And I found myself really missing that tone of a kid's show, especially like in a character like Sokka, who's a total ham. Yeah. And, you know, he's he's that's what that's the best way to describe him really as a ham here. He's pretty serious. And it was something I couldn't shake. First off, it's there all eight episodes of Geekscape. And, and the series got renewed for the final two seasons. It's a three-season storyline like in the cartoon. And and I'm glad they're not turning it into like The Hobbit in the Five Armies or whatever, right? So I finally had to like... First off, I think some parts of it, including Aang and some of the child actors, they lighten up a little bit as it as it goes. But... but if you watch the live action Netflix avatar, knowing that they have taken the, the kids fun and sometimes silliness of the animated series and turn it into, if they've kind of grown up with us and turn it into a more adult, very awesome action choreography driven dramatic version. I think you can be happy that both exist because having watched all eight episodes, not only do does it get better over the season, especially with like a, like a character like Uncle Iro and that relationship, it starts to get really nice and the actors are really good. Um, I think you'll find yourself at the end of the eight episodes having liked that you saw some of your favorite scenes from season one animated in live action. There's some great visuals. There's some really awesome fight choreography and the set pieces are they are not compromised, especially like at the end of that first season, you see some major battles between the water tribe of the North and the fire nation. And mm -hmm. they don't compromise this stuff. And it feels like some really kick-ass greatest hits. And if you accept that the Netflix version of avatar, last Airbender grew up with its audience, it, ask yourself if, if you think it would be awkward for a live action version to have the silliness and cartoonish, at times of the animated know, version because if you like the counterpoint of that would be the the one piece adaptation which mm -hmm. kept all that humor and stuff you know what i mean so I yeah and, and i did enjoy that as well but 
I enjoyed it not having seen One Piece because holy crap, 300 plus episodes. Oh my god. No, no. no I'm sorry. Not, it may not, not be in my lifetime. I'm already old. All right. No, it's it's like a thousand episodes, dude. It's Don't even. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. I can't even like, start. I've I've read some of the manga, but like no. I'm oh my god. <laughs> How great is that that we live in an age where we we can get a live action version of something that we've enjoyed in manga and anime and, and just well, live yeah, with that. Dude, it, it, it's it's a good time to be a geek but also we've gotten so complacent that how so? a lot of people online would be like oh it's not exactly how i remember it so this show sucks you know what i mean like, I'm there's glad a I have lot both. of that stuff with the with the you avatar know? last Animal bender thing yeah. i'm so glad i have both especially since the live action was heidi's first introduction to that world um and I've never seen her sit down to watch a cartoon anything. And I and I look up one day after having seen the live action and she is starting the animated series. Nice. And she is watching it and she's recognizing characters that were interpreted in the live action. And I'm like, oh my goodness, we are turning her into <laughs> a, a little bit of an anime nerd. And nice. I, will, I will take responsibility for it That's because... Great. I showed her a lot of the Miyazaki stuff, which is a nice gateway drug. And congrats to Hayao Miyazaki for winning an Oscar. He doesn't care. He's just making stuff. He, he doesn't, doesn't care. But also, how cool is it that Godzilla <laughs> won That's so his cool. first yeah. Oscar? Yeah, dude. And they it's played the music, cool. you know, yeah. what, what, the Godzilla music and all that Did stuff? you ever think you'd see the day? I was like, oh, that's the Oscar movie that I watched was the Godzilla. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no. I don't think anybody did. I love the Godzilla movie. And uh, and again, if you're a Godzilla fan and you're listening to Geekscape for the first time or you're just catching up or you want to jump in because it's comics, go back one episode and talk and hear Chris Black talk about adapting the the legendary monster verse into a TV show for Apple with that monarch legacy of monsters. He's the showrunner on that one. And uh, and I did follow up with Chris and I said, let's get Matt Fraction on the show to talk comics and Godzilla as well. So Geeks Games, we're working overtime for you guys here. Um what else it's speaking of animated, like this X-Men 97. I've been watching it. Like it's my no offense to I'm anybody so involved. Afraid. I'm so afraid. <laughs> of even, no offense to anybody involved with X-Men yeah. animated and who loves it back in the day. But it, when I have my insomnia bouts at like midnight, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I'll go watch like one or two episodes and try and work myself self back to sleep. And so that's like my my current insomnia catch up. I'm excited for the X Men '97 stuff. When you watch the old ones, do they hold up? Because I'm so scared of going back and watching them. Okay, so first off, I, I no, well, they, okay. So it, so X Men animated on Fox released the same year as Batman the animated and didn't have the budget. And you can just tell because the Batman animated. 90s series is so clean and yeah. so badass and it's beautiful and the the fox thing you got to remember you weren't you probably weren't born fernando but geekscape is in 92 93 i mean i just remember first encountering a, an animated x-men probably in 89 when i'm 10 or 11 years old 90 that was like first, a special right like pride of the x-men it, or some, some what like pride of the x-men was was a three hundred thousand dollar pilot put on by by paid for by marvel marvel entertainment it was a subsidiary of marvel comics and they wanted to do things like start testing this animated stuff obviously things like ninja turtles was popular transformers i mean in a way you got to think ronald reagan for just lifting all the <laughs> fcc regulations on selling action figures to kids because uh, 80s cartoons were just commercials for action figures for yeah. kids and you never would have gotten that earlier in the U.S. history because the FCC wouldn't have allowed it. So by the time the eight, you know eighty-seven rolls around, and you start to have the popularity of the X-Men and the Teen Titans and stuff there in the comic page, with the Marvel Wolfman stuff, with the Chris Claremont stuff, uh, you know, and obviously you have some iterations of Spider-Man live action, and you've seen the the Hulk live action, this and that. Uh, Marvel said, "Let's do an X-Men pilot." for animation but they paid for it themselves it was 300 grand which is pretty if you're going to get into the game that's hard right uh the there's a great book on this that's out right now and geeks gives google it I, I don't know the name of it but there's a brand new handsome book 
that came out about the history of X-Men, the animated series in the nineties, the woman who ran that project went and led Fox animation Saturday mornings, right? Like Fox was really started with the Simpsons and uh, what married with children and stuff like that. But like they're in their nascency in 92, 93, like they've only been a network in the U S for a few years. They definitely don't have a Saturday morning lineup. They may not have a justifiable like risk for a Saturday morning lineup, but she was the woman who was in charge of Pride of the X-Men and she brought it to Fox and she fought for it and it got canceled a few times. They changed the animation styles. Uh, a lot of this is coming off of my knowledge from having heard the Rob Liefeld podcast, which is a much better <laughs> job of this. But Rob said when this thing launched, it, they had just formed Image Comics in Jim in in left Marvel. Jim Lee was the artist on X Men, and they left Marvel and he, they started Image Comics. And an actual uh, company like message came from like either Fox or from really Marvel, and it was like, "Hey, none of the character designs can be Jim Lee style." Like, which was the popular designs and the ones that were used in the show ultimately. Yeah. But suddenly the Fox animators received a notice that said, you cannot use the Jim Lee style because Jim left us. He went and formed image. <laughs> da, 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 da. We, and, and if you make that style popular and people go back and discover the X-Men as Jim Lee drew them, they will go to image and read the Jim Lee stuff, the wildcat stuff and all that stuff. And now they're now Jim Lee is our competition. So there was a company memo that said you need to change the styles from you, you cannot have the styles in the form that they were in the pop, very popular, I think highest selling all time X Men book. Yep, eight and a half million, I think. Eight and a half million, like, like how disastrous would that have been if that company memo had been successful? Read this book because what ended up happening was these Fox animators were like, oh my god they're going to kill us because we have to use these Jim Lee designs. They nerfed it in the same way that Martin Scorsese will direct like an overly violent scene, knowing he never intended to keep it, that the studio will see the overly violent scene and be like, you have to keep, you have to, you have to cut that scene. It's too violent and overlook the scene. He did intend to keep that was violent. Right. <laughs> um, the animators were like, okay, we'll give you new designs. And they nerfed these designs. They look like crap. <laughs> like they're like the silliest, stupidest designs for the X-Men ever. And at that point, when everybody saw the designs that they proposed, we're like, how about this? They were like, oh, let's go back to the designs. And, <laughs> and, you, and you ended up with that Jim Lee design. That being Why said, not? like it holds up. You know, it's just, it's just cool to rewatch them. The, the animation is rough. You can tell it's low budget in the first season, but they're introducing some really awesome characters. I mean, they introduced cable so aggressively early yeah, really and like really. in Gambit. I was there in 91, 92, like Gambit was barely on the X-Men on the comics page by the time he premiered in the cartoon. Like they, it was crazy. It was crazy. I was like, oh, dude, this is a brand new X-Men and he's already in the cartoon. Okay, let's let's roll with this, dude. And like they introduced Sabretooth in like the first, second, third ep episode. And he has like this Weapon X flashback, like this weird Professor X goes into his brain. And, he, and, and, and all he, this stuff, yeah. Yeah, he, well, 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 Sabretooth has, he's trying to fight Xavier, right? Xavier's like, calm down. Da, da, da. And he has these psychic flashes. There's a flash of Deadpool. Oh yeah, there's a, and Shadow, dude, right? dude, yeah, dude, there's a yeah, flash yeah. of Deadpool. There's a flash of Maverick. Like the the Weapon X stuff is in like the second or third episode so of cool. X Men the animated series, that's and that's so like cool. 1992 three. I'm gonna have to when go those characters were that. barely even on the comics page by that point. <laughs> those guys like Larry Houston were badasses when it came to that X Men animated series. They went full on. Like season three is like full on like Mr. Sinister or some shit. Like, dude, that's awesome. And Sinister yeah, wasn't dude. introduced until like 89, 90 for the Silvestri stuff with Inferno. Like, yep. He's awesome. I mean, that like that cartoon for me, that was my introduction to superhero comics. That's why you gotta I started go. reading comics. You so gotta yeah, watch I guess it. I do, but I'm so scared, man. Cause I saw the trailer for the, the new series and it looks great. It's but crisp. You can tell that the, the animation and the style of drawing has changed. So I'm like, okay, am I going to still like the old one? I don't know, but I'll check it out just based on your review right now. It's such a celebration of the X-Men 
I think you got to go. I think you got to do it. I mean, right. I'll tell you what, though, like Spider-Man and his amazing friends, like I'll throw that all in the background. And it's <laughs> it's choppy, homie. Like it is the old Fantastic Four co- cartoon where they took out Johnny Storm and replaced him with Herbie because yeah. they were afraid kids are going to be lighting their asses on fire. <laughs> like, Well, they even have those old, old ones where it would be just like a, a panel from the comic and like a mouth moving. That stuff was the electric <laughs> factory. That cartoon, the the, the that yeah, series, yeah. The Electric Factory. That's where the Spider Man theme song came from. So that, like, I'll watch that stuff. Yo, <laughs> across the Spider Verse proved it's all canon, dude. Oh, yes. I got to tell you. Um, that being said, the big mm. news in the X Men oh, yeah. animated was that like Marvel fired the creator for the X Men ninety seven. I heard series, a recent Mo DeMeo. That. What did you hear was the reason that I, he was fired? I, because I, he I scraped. Because heard... he scraped his Instagram. Which okay. is which? Which made me go, okay. Disney they fire showrunners sometimes. Sometimes like budgets, stockholders, different company edicts. But they already can't. They already have two seasons down. You're gonna get yeah. two seasons, and they fire the showrunner. And what made me go, well, that's weird. Scraped his Instagram. I heard it was only fans related. I heard the same thing. Okay. What could have possibly been on that OnlyFans? I he I don't know. It was a different design for Wolverine that he was using, I guess. Get out of here with that. <laughs> <laughs> different mutant power. Oh, no. I don't know, dude. Can't nothing like... stop the juggernaut. No. Oh! <laughs> <Yeah>. oh! <laughs> what was on that Instagram? What was on that OnlyFans? Not I've an never... optic blast. <laughs> it's no, a different no, kind no. of blast. Oh, my goodness. Hey, listen, Fernando. I'm, I, I'm being sincere with you. I've never been on OnlyFans in my life. I don't. I get it though. I get that people make money. Did you hear that the the girl from the Sopranos said that she it saved her house? Oh, yeah, she paid her house and she stuff. paid her house. Like she was yeah. having trouble. Like I haven't. We have barely seen her in anything since the Sopranos. She yeah. and she then, was in Joey. And, <laughs> she was in Joey, and now she like claims that OnlyFans saved her house. Like I get it. I get yeah. it, and I don't do that whole like sex worker shame or this and that. But like, dude had a OnlyFans, and it's like. And you, but you're also working for Disney, and Disney puts out kids stuff. Like uh, I don't he, know, he was man. Doing it for the love of the game, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make friends. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> My optic blast. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I had heard the same thing. And Geeks yeah. gave us. I've, I had, that's not. I I think that's rumor as far as you and I are concerned. Like I wouldn't. But that being said, we got ourselves some controversy on the brand new x-men 97 but i'm definitely gonna watch it it looks oh, slick yeah. yeah i mean i was like in those some of those promo pieces like jean gray is pregnant mm-hmm. and i was like maybe that was why <laughs> <laughs> i mean it could but like no to, it to, picks to up supposedly it, where 97 left off with yeah but it, it, to make it as far as like we're seeing it like a lot of people saw that it that mm-hmm. doesn't get through i wouldn't think no, what a company like this. is this where you I find out you have an OnlyFans, Fernando? No, no, okay, I can't. Way to get no, a boy's I'm hopes up. Person. I'm sorry, way to get a boy's hopes up. Uh, well, <laughs> I can send you some pics if you want. Like, I'll just yeah, email it dude, to you. We've known each other 19 years yeah. now. You proposed this. <laughs> <laughs> Should have done it in 2007. Yeah, bro, because now it's older fans. <laughs> older fans, yeah. It's like it's everything like, looked better back then. Which was, is so appropriate because obviously like our bands like Blink-22 and Green Day are, are all going out it. and doing like, dude, Green Day is performing the Dookie and American yeah. Idiot in full on concert mm-hmm. like globally, right? No Effects is breaking up after this year. Yeah. Some 41 is breaking up after this album yeah. that's coming up. It sounds good too. I like this stuff. Yeah, I like Blink 182 got back together. Dude, I'm I... seeing Blink on Saturday. Really? Yeah, that's dude. so cool. Where are you living at? You're in you're in Chile. In Chile. Yeah. They're yeah. playing Lollapalooza here. I just got oh, that, that's yeah. so great. And yeah. uh I'm excited for you. That being yeah. said, like, bro, we're old and our music's Ooh. old. <laughs> but we love it. <laughs> yep. We, I, we bonded over comics. I think we stayed together <laughs> with the music and we love it yeah. so much. Uh dude, it I'm wearing I an alkaline you, trio shirt, man. <laughs> I love the alkaline trio. Favorite band the alkaline time. trio. I love that you said that. That's really yeah. awesome. Um I saw Max Skiba. I have his phone number and I've been too scared to invite him on Geekscape, and it's been like 10 years. Dude. Because he was at the swingers restaurant in Hollywood, and I just kind of stopped and I was like, hey Matt. I helped you on one of the, your music videos. My friend Piper Ferguson directed it. I was there. Like, I remember we had a good, 
running. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I'd love to have you on Geekscape. I took his number. The first time I met Matt Skiba was I had approached him about playing our radio show in college. Okay. In the summer of 99, I lived in New York and they were opening for the International Noise Conspiracy in, on concert, in concert. And he invited me to the knitting factory back when it was in Manhattan. And I remember I lived in one of the worst fucking parts of Brooklyn. <laughs> and it was scary as hell. Like one guy tried to jump me one time coming out, coming home one night. And I remember going to the knitting factory to see Alkaline Trio. First time I saw them live and they weren't headlining. It was the international noise conspiracy. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing the Alkaline Trio and being like, oh, that's awesome. And going up to Matt afterwards and Dan and be like, oh, that's so great. And I really want to get you in the studio when you get to Philly to like record you guys for a radio show, which we recorded some amazing bands like Newfound Glory, Midtown, The Bouncing Souls, etc. And I, um, first off, we have all that recording too. And we found a, a Blink-182 interview that I did in 99 with Kevin, where yeah. it sounds like, dude, it sounds like our balls hadn't dropped. <laughs> <laughs> Were they still with Scott? No, it's 99. No, 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 so no. It was, no. It was Travis. Travis. Park. Travis okay. Yeah, Travis is in it. And like, but like, Anima of the State had just come out like a month nice. or two earlier. And I can put that on the feed. Like, if I, if you guys want, I can Dude. release my college radio interview. Send it to me if you don't yeah. want to put it up. For sure. For I sure. Uh, uh, I remember we were dressed as Mexican wrestlers and <laughs> Travis saw us dressed as Mexican wrestlers when he walked into the room to do the interview. <laughs> and, and Mark and Dom were like, yeah, we're down. Travis walked in, saw Kevin and I dressed as Mexican wrestlers and goes, yeah, you guys do that one without me. <laughs> He's like, He's like no, I'm not doing this weird shit. <laughs> That's so, so accurate. <laughs> so Matt Skiba told me, he tells me, he's like, yes, like I want to do your radio show. It never ended up happening, but he's like, you got to stay for an international noise conspiracy or you're an idiot. He said those exact words. If you leave during international noise conspiracy, you're an idiot. At this point, it's like 11 o'clock at night. They're probably going to go on for an hour. I'm You're thinking about what I'm thinking about going <laughs> <laughs> like, go through the projects in Brooklyn at like one o'clock in the morning and getting myself fucking stabbed. Yeah, no kidneys <laughs> for you, my friend. <laughs> Daniel Johnson is in the comments on YouTube and he says, release it. Dude, yeah, yeah I'll release the you know what? I'll I'll find a way to like put some context to the interviews and I'll release the interviews. The music obviously I can't release and like saves the day or you released theirs as the second if you get the through being cool double album 20th anniversary oh my god it's 20th anniversary the second album the second lp in that double album is the recording that we did for the radio show and they mastered it it's awesome you can hear me go like woo or something i think i don't know <laughs> um but yeah dude i felt bad so i saw matt skiba a few years ago in swingers here in hollywood and I explained, ah, da, da, da. and he's like, "Hey, let me give you a number." I've never, dude. I'm oh, scared, man. bro. But maybe, I mean, maybe I just ask him to come on Kickscape and be like, "Fuck it." I, I would like. I don't know if I would be able to talk. I'd be too much of a fanboy. That dude. Oh, really? I love like his lyrics, man. Like it's amazing. I love it's amazing. I love the Auckland Trio. Love them. Yeah, um, you got, we got to talk about this Dune yeah. too. Did I haven't seen see it yet. I'm not gonna spoil yet. it for you. Okay. But they did previews here in the States like a week before Dune Part 2. And I liked Dune, Dune Part 1. I thought it was really cool. Awesome. Like, what an impressive movie. Um, I read this book probably late middle school, early high school. And by the second book, I was like, this is getting not... Eh, I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty like, weird. Like, yeah. yeah, that is... He's like, kid turns into a fucking worm. <laughs> like, like, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. But I still enjoyed that first book and obviously i love the the lynch movie for fun i like the mini series uh, you know i consider myself a dune fan and i think this dennis de villeneuve the villeneuve thing i think he, he's incredible and he's the dude to make it right but when i went to see dune 2 i gotta tell you like everybody was raving about it because they went to the sneak previews and I, I i found it kind of flat like you're gonna kill me for doing saying that but i'm not <laughs> i i think about the first one and i think about this one and i'll just tell you as a storyteller when everything is important like when you try to make everything important at the end of the day nothing's important does that make sense like i feel like i I came out of there being like oh my god every moment was important every fight was epic every like everything was pregnant with life or death and the saving of the people and paul's journey and his destiny as, as a savior and 
there was so much of that that I was like, but what about some humor? <laughs> but well, what that, about, does that make that sense? Was, yeah. I mean, that was, uh, I, I think the first one is an amazing movie, but that was those movies are so impressive. Now. They're incredible. Exactly. They're amazing. Amazing. But I just like the whole, everything is so serious and it feels cold to me. You know what I mean? Like even it in the most cold. serious yeah. moments in life, there's always a little bit of humor, a little bit of lightness you know and so, we all know that star wars is based on dune and it's yeah. heavily inspired by dune but it really makes you appreciate a character uh like a an audience surrogate like like han, han solo, solo who yeah. can be like yeah it's a lot of crazy shit <laughs> you know what i mean like, <laughs> yeah, it's like what the hell is going on yeah. you're like it almost needs a, a character and i think a josh brolin character would have been okay but he's in the midst of it now and, and he does feel like a, a bit of a breath of fresh air when he shows up in the second movie um but uh, I, I I was like yeah no and there's not a lot of peaks and valleys in this stuff and it and it really this the it wore me out and at the risk of spoiling one thing like go for it they want to criticize a character like Ray for being a Mary Sue and like being like so powerful from the get from the drop but like that yeah. that is very much educated by a character like Paul Atreides who is absolutely like some jesus surrogate white savior Definitely. like from the start he's awesome at everything yeah. and there and there so one of the scenes that for me took the legs out of it not that i wasn't completely blown away by performances it, technically design. it's amazing like, oh it's amazing no one's arguing but that. there is a scene where they're like they're testing him right as like the freemen are testing him and they're going to send him out of the desert and and people do not come back like you will not come back there's there's like all these poisonous horrible things in the desert that will kill you beyond just the worms right like he's listing like scorpions and like rous's and so like that that, I, that was a joke rodents of unusual size remember okay you get it uh so they're naming all the things in the desert that will kill him and how he has to go through the desert and if he returns then he can right so he starts they're, they're seriously like you're gonna fucking die yeah. and you see him leave on his quest and zendaya is like good luck don't die <laughs> <laughs> right like you're like and i'm like oh and like i'm i got my pop i got my dune bucket i'm i'm like hyped i'm like oh man i'm in <laughs> i'm gonna see some shit now this is gonna be you bad the bucket you got the bucket. the bucket i'm not gonna talk about that in a public <laughs> forum no i'm kidding <laughs> I, I, did, I did ask for extra butter I did, I did not get the bucket <laughs> so i'm like super stoked to see this sequence okay and he goes off into the desert cut to him like later like just with the freeman like chilling and i'm like everything worked out guys <laughs> i guess he survived that really cool that sequence cool. you guys promised us you just got to him like right. setting up a moisturizer was then <laughs> i was, I was <laughs> yeah. honestly like i just got the bucket guys I, you had on? me primed you had the bucket in place <laughs> i was ready and you yanked me yeah dude and and so so I felt like that was indicative, well, to, at least to me. That's like it's like you guys are shoving a lot into this, and the, it, there's not enough like character proving moments. Yeah, it's it's all spectacle, and like I, I don't want to say that because that sounds like like there's no substance. Okay, okay. that makes sense. Like spectacle yeah, to me completely feels makes hollow. Sense. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's. I don't think it, I think it has substance. I think there's some really beautiful art in this movie, mm -hmm. but peaks and valleys. Like what are the highs and lows? Where are moments where the character, where, an audience has to find their way into a story? Where are the moments where an audience can find their way into the story? Because if everything is life and death impressive beyond the stars in t tantamount, how does the person who's just like, oh shit, I got to do laundry after this movie's over? Yes. Where do they find themselves in relation to things that are at that heavy of odds? And again, thank God for Han Solo in a Star Wars movie as the audience surrogate to say like, laser swords and wizardry like i'm yeah. from one side of the galaxy to the other and you can't fucking convince me of any of that shit so that when you convince han solo in the in in the star wars when you convince han solo you're convincing the audience and if you don't have somebody going on that journey with the audience i feel i feel like you might end up with an experience like this where it's like oh uh where are we again is it i guess he survived the desert <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that makes sense man yeah uh yeah i I do want to see it on the big screen as you should because that's how you have to see it. But I don't know, like the first one pissed me off that it didn't end. Whoa, 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 whoa. Piss you off. 
Yeah, dude, because it's three hours of a movie, and okay. then Zendaya says this is only the beginning, and it yeah. ends. Okay, and I'm like, but you knew there was a second movie coming, right? No, I didn't. <laughs> oh shit! What I got to the Chilean... movie and it said part one, and I was like, Oh, what the hell! What kind of Chilean marketing? Fucking dude, shit! Dude. Everything oh, said no. Dune. Nothing said Dune part one, bro. Oh, I'm sorry. Geekscape bailed you because we did not tell you in advance that, yes, there's two parts. I knew going into part one there was part two. I didn't know. Part two was dependent on the success of part one, which is why it didn't come like within the year. Right. They filmed it after the success of part one, for sure. But like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, homie. Thumbs up on that. Like, <laughs> I'm really funny. sorry. No, well, I run a thing called Geekscape. Okay. Sometimes I do a podcast where we talk news and reviews. That news... Did not enter your ears. No, not some not of the news sense. could have been like, hey, they're doing a second, they're doing a two-part dune. Which makes <laughs> sense. I mean, it's a huge saga, but huge. I thought like it'll finish, like it'll give me an arc. And I, I don't mm -hmm. feel like I got an arc. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. I feel like that's right. a failing on my part. <laughs> when you sorry. see me in San Diego Comic Con in eight years, mm -hmm. you can slap me in the face. I will. I will. I'll be a father then. So don't do it in front okay. of my daughter, please. Okay. I'll, I'll being try sad. not to. I'll make her look the other way. Okay, be like, sweetie, you're gonna want to turn around for this. Yeah, <laughs> you motherfucker, yeah. why did you tell me that that dude was in two parts? Start like spewing me in Spanish, start yelling at something. I'll understand what you're saying if you say it in Spanish, and hopefully she will too. Uh, we gotta yeah, work on that. I'll, I'll teach my girl Spanish. Um, so what are you reading, man? As we talk comics, like, what am I reading? Yeah. Um, I've been reading some stuff lately. I read the first volume of Human Target, which got collected yeah. a little. That was great. Um, Just like, look. Uh, yeah, it's so good, man. I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. I got in because of the artwork. Greg Smallwood is amazing. Yeah. And but the story was so good, and the cliffhanger at the end of the first volume was like, oh, okay. Do you know if these uh, Black Label books are in continuity for DC or? No, I don't believe they are. And it, like okay. Warner Brothers, we gotta have this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because well, James Gunn came out this week. And okay. they're, he said that they're shooting the second season of the John Cena thing. Um, oh, yeah. Peacemaker. Peacemaker. Yes. And he says, okay, we're shooting Peacemaker season two concurrently with his Superman film. Now only labeled Superman. Mm -hmm. uh, named, and, I, and I'm so stoked for both because I loved Peacemaker. I love James. Yeah, Peacemaker was and great. I, and I, love, I can't wait to see him do a really hopeful, awesome Superman uh, so I'm really excited. He also said, though, that this one is in continuity with his Gods and Monsters new DC, you know, universe, but that season one was not in canon. Yeah. Huh. And so and, are they restarting it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Is he going to have to fight his dad again? <laughs> 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 Eagle is gonna have to. I don't know. Here, here's the thing. Like, I know that the Snyderverse characters did. It. Spoiler: If you haven't seen Peacemaker, you should have. But I know that there's like cameos of like some of the Snyderverse characters at the end. Of <laughs> the, the ones they could finale. get that day. It was so great. It was so great. Yeah. And it was. And here's the cool thing about it. It was shot by the Guardians of the Galaxy three crew. Yeah, yeah. Like that was so fucking cool. I love that. Yeah. Um, but in saying here's here's the thing, Geekscape is because some people started texting me like, "What does this mean? It's season two of a show, but the first season is in continuity." Like, I don't know what's happening. And and here's the rule, okay, Geekscape is forget what the co giant corporations are telling you about what's con what's canon and what's not canon, because we absolutely got Tim Burton's Bruce Wayne back over the summer in the Flash movie. We absolutely oh, yeah, in across in across the universe yeah. across the universe the Spider Verse we absolutely got several live action nods to the spider-man films we got we got the electric factory spider-man in there yeah. uh in no way home we got the stuff going on like we for sure are living in a multiverse and i don't think james gunn in the new dc and, I, and james gunn knows this he's he's a fanboy like us but like a new dc universe can't escape that and they are going to have beats from that first season they'll have rented residents in this second season because they're the same characters and yeah. there's a Waller show and Amanda Waller, it was in a lot of the Snyderverse and she's now going to be 
in the the James Gunn verse and all that stuff. And, so just and I think that's great. Whatever, whatever. Yeah, it's it's all a multiverse. And like clearly, there was an Aquaman two after the first after the Flash movie, and the end credit kind of scene has the Momoa Aquaman in it, and but it also has a a remade Bruce Wayne in it with the with the George Clooney. It, it all counts. Here's the thing, Geekscape is when you talk about the multiverse, you think it all counts. It's all some shift of the universe that you knew possibly shifted into a new universe. Because here's the thing. The, the third Warner Brothers Batman movie after the Keaton movies had Val Kilmer and it's still the same Bruce Wayne. The next one had Clooney. Still the same Bruce Wayne. All right, that was those those four movies that they made in the 90s for with Batman, 89, early to the 90s. Those are supposed to be the same Bruce Wayne. So when you have that same Bruce Wayne show up in the same Flash movie and one of them is played by, by Michael Keaton and one of them is played by George Clooney, kind of makes your head scratch. The multiverse is all a shift in a in a shading of each other. Like, it all counts. If that's your favorite movie, if you went to Black Adam and you're like, fuck yeah, I want to see more of this Black Adam movie, it counts. I know you didn't say that. You I, I didn't say anything. I'm just saying I did see Black Adam. You saw it, right? Yeah, I saw it with that Black little Adam. Bart Simpson kid. Yeah. The, no, it's T2 when he's like skateboarding down the road lines. <laughs> yeah. It's tight. That movie was not good, dude. <laughs> now, he, don't be rude. That being I like said, Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan was Pierce awesome. Pierce Brosnan was great. Dude, Dr. Fate was sick. The Dr. Yeah, Fate, I mean, Hawkman. I want to see that movie. JSA yeah. was. Yeah, you, exactly. you, and what I'm telling you is, you can get it. And like, you just you just do what they're what DC is doing right. What Warner Brothers is doing right is that you gotta come out bold with this brand new DC you know, cinematic universe. You gotta come out, you gotta go all in, and then the stuff that you think worked, like some of the stuff comes back because like people cheered when they saw Andrew Garfield in in No Way Home. I he was the best part of that movie for me, and I love everything in that movie, but Andrew Garfield from two Spider-Man movies, which I kind of bemoaned. I loved him. Uh, which brings us to you. Okay. you know what? Don't do that to me on my show. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> which brings me to our good friend. Maybe we close with this. My good friend, Joseph Culp, who played Dr. Doom in the um, Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie that most of y'all haven't even seen. You can watch it I actually on that. YouTube. Uh, is it good? Well, it was made for a million dollars. That being said, is it tonally true to Stanley and Jack Kirby? Yes. It is. <laughs> and I, I want to tell you real fast, Geekscape, is that my friend Carl Ciorfolio, who put together the Fantastic Four reunion episode several years ago and had the cast of the Fantastic Four, Carl is in Vegas and his stunt driving and stunt career, he was Blunt Man. He went through the wall as Blunt Man in Mall Rats. Uh, he was Kevin Smith's stunt, stunt double for that. His his stunt career is caught up with him, and his body is having difficulties. So if you go to GoFundMe and you look for Carl Cirafolio, he is, uh, you know, he's his body is busted and and he's having an, uh, trouble. So so search GoFundMe for his uh his 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 fund. What do you call that? Uh, you know, his, yeah, his thing and fun. and and help him out because because it's it's insane to see somebody who drove cars. For Christopher Nolan in Dark Knight, and in the movie Drive with Ryan Gosling, and did a million stunts and wore the Thing costume in Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. It was just such a physical guy. It's really humbling to see him have difficulties in like drinking out of a straw, mm-hmm. while he's like w- trying to f- get his mobility back in a hospital bed. That being said, like I was not expecting Joseph Colt to like email me and say, hey, I have this letter and it's a couple of websites have picked up on it. And it basically says, I'm going to read this, not all the letter, but the curse of the Fantastic Four, why Marvel's Fantastic Four film franchise has never succeeded in how to fix it by Joseph Culp, the first live action Doctor Doom. And the letter goes, this is an open letter to Marvel Studios. Dear Marvel Studios, I'll just read you the first lines. The reason why the last three film versions of Marvel's Fantastic Four have never been as successful as hoped is because the first 1994 film version has never been officially released or acknowledged. After 30 years, the now historic and glaring omission in the film canon remains a blind spot and has become a blockage in the energetic system of Marvel's film franchise lineage. The blind spot has far-reaching del- deleterious <laughs> that, is, that is such a doom word effects. 
deleterious, deleterious effects. It has literally deleted the goodwill. Deleterious. The 1994 film, The Fantastic Four, was, that which was produced by Roger Corman for new Constantine films in order to have Constantine hold the franchise and uh, hold the, the rights. And let me tell you, when the Marvel version of Fantastic Four with Pedro Pascal comes out, there will be a new Constantine Films logo in front of it. It was held back from release is now one of the biggest cult films of all time. The film was shelved and rumored to have been destroyed yet for over 30 years, the fan base grew into the millions. And yes, I mean, there's some amazing stuff like doomed the documentary. You can go back in the Geekscape feed, but he then goes and starts arguing his points. The fantastic four 94 is better than most. Yes. Love it. Uh, it's, it's a pretty pure movie is the fantastic four franchise cursed. He says that there is a system systemic curse. The three officially released film versions of Marvel's Fantastic Four, 2005, 2007, 2015, have never been entirely successful creatively, commercially, or with the fans because they bear the burden of a systemic curse. It's energetic in nature and can be understood through basic systemic constellation theory. Wow. I'm not I'm not too up on constellation theory, but <laughs> you know, Doctor Doom does work with the arcane, so maybe this is what we're talking about. Uh, he then goes on and says the solution to the blind spot. Light Must Be Shed, How to Lift the Fantastic Four Curse. Step one, officially release the film. Which is like, okay, I think fans would love that. Release the film, put it on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. Release the film, let's see it. It's it's interesting. Step two. Here's where Marvel's going to be like, oh, hey, hold on, hold on. Lifting the curse through the multiverse. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, boy. Including include Fantastic Four 94 and Marvel's upcoming Fantastic Four film franchise through creative inclusion. Now that Marvel has eagerly embraced the concept of the multiverse and has applied it in films such as Doctor Strange 2 Madness of the Multiverse, or the Multiverse of Madness, but Joe's mm -hmm. let my man cook. Let my man cook. And Spider Man No Way Home, the possibilities for lifting the F4 curse are wide open. There we go. Kevin Feige now includes all of Marvel's past work as canon. So, like, honestly, he's arguing, like, why not this? Yeah, but he says Marvel should allow the release of the heretofore, heretofore silenced 1994 Fantastic Four and find a creative way to include the first film in the multiverse of the newest one. If this happens, the publicity, social media, and box office will explode for the benefits of your studio, the progenitors, no, the progenitors, the fans, and the legacy of one of the very best and enduring comics Marvel ever created quote in quotes here's to the future my friend dr doom and the fantastic four respectfully joseph culp and the original fantastic four 94 family um okay let's do it <laughs> yeah, man. let's do it man let's do yeah, it why not put that why shit not, out there dude? i'm yeah. down um i love i liked joseph culp i liked having him on geekscape and i loved geekscape being like one of the first re cast reunions but um, why not? Like I said about the, I can't like harp on more. They put out Inhumans, man. Let's put out this. Out like, and I've also heard that like Eternals isn't going to get a sequel. I yeah, hate it's to be not the surprising. One yeah. yeah. Would I love to make an Eternals movie? Like I think all that Jack Kirby stuff is so awesome. I'd love to. Do it's it great. Eternals, so I, love I think it. Eternals should have been a series though. I um, hear you. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Well. Man. Fernando, we've talked a lot of geek stuff, man. We have. I promised all the geek talk that can fit under the, your little noggin. Dude, Geekscape us, and we did it. Fernando, what are some of the stretch goals on this gun punch? Uh, some of the stretch goals, uh, you can get uh, bigger stickers, you can get more pins, uh, and if, of course, you have all the other stuff. You have pr uh, Princess, you can get the hardcover, you can get the soft cover, you can get di digital uh, edition. Uh, you can get some bookmarks if we reach a certain stretch goal. There's a bunch of stuff that you can get through the Gun Punch Kickstarter. Uh, you can get to it through my website, FernandoPintoArt.com, or just search for Gun Punch on Kickstarter and it'll get you right there. We already funded, but we're trying to get to those stretch goals to like get it to as many people as we can. I'm, I'm proud of you, dude. Thank I'm you, proud dude. Of you. proud of you as um, well. Love you, dude, man. I'm so glad you yeah, came on Geekscape. Uh, you know, the artist from my current comic that Geekscape is to learn about in the coming months, it's also Chilean. You told me about that. Yeah. And people uh, are wonderful. 
I know. Yeah, I can if, if he if he doesn't understand something that I write, I can just say it in Spanish or put it in Spanish, and it, it's all working its way out. See, there you go. I'm excited to share that with the world. Um, Fernando, thanks, man. Uh, FernandoPinto.com is that correct? Yep, FernandoPintoArt.com, and you can Fernando get to all my art. sites. FernandoPintoArt.com. Okay, and Geekscape is you know how to find us. Geekscape.net. We're on all the social media after, as Geekscape. I'm Jonathan at Geekscape.net. If you want to shoot me an email and be like, hey. I hear what you're saying, man, but I disagree <laughs> with you respectfully. Um, we got some Geekscapes coming, man. Next week, we're talking more comics. Week after that, I guess we got some mo movies, movies, video games, comics, TV. I love this stuff. Uh, Fernando, good luck with the rest of the Kickstarter. I'm going to go and donate this week. And thank you, uh, thank you dude. Love thank you so for much. Having me. It was great. Dude, always, always, always good for a conversation. Okay. And here is Matt Skiba's phone number. <laughs> Here we go. You ready? It sure. is. Okay. It is area code. Right. Are you writing this down? 